pharmacy, the pharmaceutical industry is, I mean, I've been in this industry quite some time now, and it's suddenly one of the most exciting times I can remember. Pascal Claude Roland Soriot nació el 23 de mayo de 1959. Su entrañable amor por los caballos lo llevó a estudiar medicina veterinaria realizando sus estudios en la Escuela Nacional Veterinaria de Alford y más adelante realizó un máster de negocios en la Escuela de Estudios Superiores de Comercio de París. Inició su carrera dentro de la industria de biotecnología en el año de 1986, logrando desempeñarse en puestos de alta dirección dentro de diversas compañías alrededor del mundo. En 1996, se convirtió en gerente general de la empresa química Hertz Marine Russell, en Australia. En 2006 fue nombrado CEO de Genentech, una empresa de productos biológicos, donde dirigió una exitosa fusión con Roche. Debido a sus grandes resultados, se desempeñó como director de operaciones de la División de Productos Farmacéuticos de Roche de 2010 a 2012. Actualmente es director ejecutivo de la multinacional farmacéutica anglo-sueca AstraZeneca. Pascal desarrolló una gran pasión por la ciencia y la medicina, así como una gran expertise en mercados establecidos y emergentes, solidez y pensamiento estratégico, además de un historial exitoso en la gestión de cambios y ejecución de estrategias, y una habilidad para liderar diversas organizaciones. I want to extend our gratitude to all those working in hospitals, in care homes and other such facilities, as well as to those researching new ways to fight this pandemic. We stand with you. México, siglo XXI y todos sus becarios, quienes son el espíritu de un México nuevo, le dan la bienvenida a un hombre que trabaja incansablemente por darnos una luz de esperanza al final del túnel. Pascal Soriot. Hola a todos, buenos días, hello, good day. I'm really excited to be invited to speak to you today. As outstanding scholars of the Telmex Telcel Foundation, you are the future leaders of Mexico and beyond. You are the leaders of tomorrow who will have the power to continue to bring about positive change and make our world a better place for everyone. And today's event, made possible by the Foundation, provides a great opportunity to share, to learn and reflect as we all try to shape a positive future despite the challenges presented by the unprecedented situation in which we find ourselves. Before I introduce the themes of my presentation, I want to recognize the importance of the scholarship program and its goals of providing equal opportunities for students based on both academic excellence and contribution to society. The diversity of speakers and participants attending this event is a great testament to this vision. I personally certainly was not planning on becoming the CEO of one of the world's most innovative companies when I started out in my career. I came from a very modest background and I grew up in an affordable housing suburb. I got into some scrapes at time but I always pushed myself to be, to be the very best I could be. This commitment enabled me to get into university very young, where I studied to be a vet because I love horses. As I completed my studies and got older, I decided that I actually wanted to join the pharmaceutical industry. My father died, unfortunately, very young. My mother didn't work at the time, and I had three young brothers. So I had to work a few years as a host vet before I could change course and go to business school. I'm sharing these details of my life to show you that with hard work, commitment and flexibility, you can take your career and your life into many different exciting directions. I've been lucky to be able to work in New Zealand, in Australia, in Japan, in Switzerland, in the United States, in New Jersey, in California, and more recently in the UK and I've learned to appreciate different people and cultures. Even though I actually was born in an underprivileged suburb in France, and I never left my country of birth until I was 24 years of age. After business school, I joined the pharmaceutical industry, which enabled me to focus on science, medicine, and making a contribution to society. 
The diversity of professional settings, cultures, and also challenges that I have been fortunate to experience, particularly during the earlier years of my career, fundamentally shaped my values, my leadership style, and also my appreciation of how we can all contribute to society. It is these values and these attributes that have helped to shape my, jo my journey as CEO of AstraZeneca, and that will be the focus of my presentation today. The first point I wanted to make today concerns the importance of living and holding true to your values. When I first joined AstraZeneca, the organization faced a number of challenges, including declining sales and a weak product pipeline, which is the lifeblood of pharmaceutical companies. So why did I take on the role? Each time you change jobs, you have to ask yourself if it is the right thing to do. Personally, I have always been attracted to and, and I've taken jobs that were always a bit of a risk. Risk is part of life and it is part of everything we do at AstraZeneca. And I had no hesitation in accepting the challenge. It was a company I had always admired, not least for its focus on scientific innovation. And I knew it had great people and great potential. It had just lost its focus on the fundamentals. In our industries, fundamentals start with a focus, a relentless focus on pushing the boundaries of science to deliver life-changing medicines. And to achieve this, there was much to do at AstraZeneca to rebuild the company's self-confidence and the culture. Today, I'm very proud to see how the efforts of everyone across the company over many years are paying off not least in how we are delivering medicines and solutions that are helping patients who are facing some of the world's, the world's most serious health challenges, and also the way the company is making a positive contribution to society. So what has helped to guide our actions at AstraZeneca during the turnaround? First, we identified and we laid out a clear strategic focus. Secondly, we established a shared a shared purpose that guides all of us. That shared purpose is to push the boundaries of science to discover life-changing medicine. Our common goal, the reason we come to work every day, is to innovate, to discover new medicines and write new pages in the medical textbooks. Having a shared purpose, knowing what you come to work every day is fundamental. And finally, and most importantly, we defined a set of values that are more than words on paper. They help us drive progress on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as act as a check and balance on all our actions. What are those values? First, we follow the science, following the twists and turns that science presents. Second, we put patients first, ensuring they are at the heart of everything we do. Third, we're entrepreneurial. We look for opportunities to innovate. And fourth, we play to win, aiming to deliver the best possible results. Fifth and finally, we do the right thing, focusing on the greater good of our company and society. As I said earlier, these values drive decisions and behaviors across AstraZeneca, and our response to COVID-19 presents examples of how we are living each of those values. I'll cover our response to the pandemic in detail later, but my question for you to reflect on at this stage is whether you are clear on your values and how they're connected to your decisions. My second theme today is leadership. Another key factor that has been central to AstraZeneca's progress. Leaders are crucial in enabling and supporting the 70,000 employees who make AstraZeneca what it is. Leaders provide direction, they identify priorities, and they speed decision-making. But most importantly, leaders need to reinforce every day our shared purpose and live our values. As a leader, I would describe my personal style in two words, casual intensity. These are two words that have a symbiotic relationship. I have found that being casual, being approachable, empathetic, inclusive, helps to foster an environment where people feel able to share their views and to engage in debate that drives innovation. We should also be humble and accept we will sometimes fail. 
which is a factor in all companies, and in particular in pharma where science is complex, we have to take educated risk, and of course you can fail and you have to accept it. But performance is also key. There must be an intensity to our actions, a desire to push ourselves to achieve stretching personal and professional goals. This is of course about outcomes, but it is also about hiring the best people and trusting in them, being curious, fostering a learning culture. This intensity is vital to delivering for patients and other stakeholders, and also to making a contribution to society, my final theme for today. So in a nutshell, you must take your, your job very seriously, but we should not take ourselves seriously. Before I move on, my second question to you is whether you have considered your leadership style. What actually drives you and who are you and, and how do you lead? What, how do you think you will be leading in your respective companies? Finally, the importance of singing, being and contribution to society is what I would like to talk about. Earlier this year, I announced a program called Ambition Zero Carbon committing AstraZeneca to eliminating greenhouse gas emissions from our sites and our fleet by 2025 without carbon credits and to be carb becoming carbon negative across our entire value chain by 2030. When asked about my motivations to implement this program, which is very ambitious, I look at my children and my grandson who will maybe one day ask me, what did you do to address the global climate crisis? Every one of us has the potential to contribute to society and collectively we make a big difference. The current pandemic is a clear example. COVID-19 has no borders. Many lives have been lost across the world. Jobs have gone and our way of life has been disrupted as governments have taken the steps to try to control the spread of the virus. As CEO of a science-driven company, I knew we had to step up to fight the virus and support society. AstraZeneca is a company blessed with some of the world's best scientists. We have partnerships with leading academic institutions and companies, and we have global reach with operations in over 100 countries that could make a big difference. But more than this, we are a team that, that leads our values and knows the power of what science can do. So as the virus emerged, we landed on four objectives where we believed we could make a difference. First of all, we provided emergency relief and humanitarian support. For example, as the virus took hold, we donated 9 million face masks and other medical supplies to countries most in need. We also worked diligently to ensure the continuity of care and patient safety. Our medicines are important, and for example, switching the administration of these medicines to patients at home rather than in hospital enable physicians to continue taking care of their patients without exposing them to the risk of coming to the hospital. Thirdly, we ensured the continued supply of our medicines. Throughout the pandemic, patients have remained in need of medicines and despite having to overcome considerable, considerable challenges to supply chains, I'm proud to say that we have maintained supply. It was of course very important, all our medicines are needed and patients needed to be able to keep controlling their chronic conditions. Lastly, we are driving forward research and development, and so let me tell you a little bit about what we are doing. First of all, we have a COVID-19 monoclonal, monoclonal antibody research. We have recently identified and progressed antibodies into clinical development. As you may know, monoclonal antibodies mimic natural antibodies. They support the, um, the body's immune response. And we hope that an antibody-based treatment could neutralize the virus and be given as a preventative option for those who are exposed. It could also be used to treat the disease progression in patients that are already infected by the virus. Finally, it also has the potential to provide an immediate effect in the patient. So therefore, those can be used for prophylactic use or for treatment. Secondly, we are exploring how our some of our existing compounds might help in the treatment of COVID-19. These are by reducing the excessive immune response in some patients or protecting the organs from damage. Our hope is that by doing so, these compounds 
will support the recovery and keep patients out of intensive care. And thirdly, we are collaborating to bring forward a potential vaccine. Earlier this year, we established a collaboration with the University of Oxford for the global development, manufacturing and distribution of the university's potential vaccine. Clinical trials were initiated with an unprecedented development timeline and phase 1-2 trial results published in July demonstrated encouraging results. Late-stage trials have been underway for now a few months and some 18,000 people have participated so far and the enrollment in the trials is moving very quickly. You may have seen recent coverage about the trial being briefed, uh, briefly paused, and then we are restarted. In large vaccine trials such as this one, it is expected that some participants will become unwell and every case has to be carefully evaluated. This is what happened recently with our trial. It was a standard action in line with our continuing commitment to the safety of participants and to maintaining the highest standards of conduct in our trials. And after evaluation, the authorities and the experts allowed us to restart. So with trial now uh, approved to restart and moving forward, we expect to be able to announce results later this year. And of course, it depends on the rate of infection within the clinical trial communities that will define when we get results. Of course, ensuring the vaccine reaches patients is also critical and we've already secured capacity to supply some 3 billion doses in the world. And we've established parallel supply chain in, ge in different geographies to remove the question of who gets the vaccine first. This includes an agreement with the Carlos Slim Foundation to supply the vaccine to Latin America. I want to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Slim and the Foundation for stepping up to collaborate with us to establish this supply chain and provide access to the vaccine to millions of Latin Americans if the trials are successful. It has been a pleasure to see countries across Latin America collaborate to manufacture the vaccine for the benefit of all people in Latin America. This project has been a great demonstration of public-private partnership and a great example of what can be achieved when people from different walks of life come together to resolve an issue. We have also committed to making the vaccine available at no profit during the pandemic, so the vaccine can be available in a fair and equitable manner to everybody around the world. The progress we've made against our objectives in such a short space of time is remarkable, and I could not be prouder of the team at AstraZeneca who delivered this fantastic progress. I hope you can also see how our work exemplifies how we are living our values. Following the science, putting patients first, playing to win, being entrepreneurial, and doing the right thing, of course. We will get through this challenge as a society. It is just a question of when. But with the progress taking place across the pharmaceutical industry, many companies are working on this challenge. I'm confident that a brighter, brighter future is not too far away. So, as you move forward in your careers and your personal lives, I would like to leave you with the following challenges for how you do so. First of all, I would urge you to think about your values and your purpose and consider how they match with those of organizations you are considering joining. Will you be joining a team of people who share your values and do they share a common purpose that inspires you? Second, consider your leadership style. How do you want others to see you as a leader? What will make you successful in your chosen path. And third, always think big and consider how you can make a difference to society. What the COVID-19 situation has taught us all is that our society is more fragile than we had thought. The world need to come together before we are faced with challenges that are even harder to overcome, such as an environmental catastrophe, and every one of us can make a difference. Finally, Remember that taking smart risks is, is part of progress, whether it is in your professional role or to manage your career. So be flexible, do not hesitate to take educated risks and accept you might fail. If you fail, simply dust yourself up and start again. You will learn from your successes and you will learn even more from your setbacks. Last of all, I hope my presentation today has helped to reinforce that with hard work, 
commitment and passion. You can achieve your goals no matter where you start off in life. So with that, let me congratulate you for your extraordinary achievement and thank you for your time and your attention. I hope that you and your loved ones stay safe and well. The virus has not gone away and we must all take pre precautionary measures until such time that safe and effective medicines are available. Muchas gracias. Thank you again for this opportunity, Tony. I'd be very happy to answer your questions now. Pascal, en primer lugar, muchas gracias por compartir tus conocimientos en un tema que está en la mente de todos. Un evento muy desafortunado, un evento catastrófico que ha afectado la salud, la vida, el empleo de millones de personas y también la situación global de la economía. Lo que AstraZeneca ha logrado hasta ahora no tiene precedentes, no solo por el rápido desarrollo de la vacuna, sino también porque simultáneamente se han establecido alianzas en diferentes regiones del mundo con fabricantes, proveedores, gobiernos y organizaciones sociales como la propia Fundación Carlos Slim para que la vacuna esté disponible y sin fines de lucro lo antes posible y para la mayor cantidad de personas como sea posible. Hemos sido testigos de cómo trabaja tu equipo de trabajo, lo rápido que actúan y la rapidez también en la toma de decisiones, pero por favor platícanos cómo ha sido este desafío. Thank you for the question, Tony. This is in fact a global crisis that demands a global response. You're right. Though we are a science-driven company, coming up with a therapeutic or vaccine is a only part of the solution. We need, to, we need to make it available to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. And from the very beginning, we committed to a broad and equi equitable supply of the vaccine around the world at no profit during the pandemic. No single company or individual can tackle this challenge alone. So our approach has been based on partnering with stakeholders with complementary strengths And we have worked with governments and other organizations around the world to help beat this virus. So far, our supply capacity towards uh, 3 billion doses of the vaccine candidate have been agreed with the UK, the US, Japan, Australia, China, the Europe's Inclusive Vaccines Alliance, the Coalition for the Epidemic Preparedness, Gavi, uh, the Vaccine Alliance, and also the Serum Institute of India, our farm in Russia, few crews in Brazil, and finally, very importantly, our alliance with the Slim Foundation in LATAM. We also continue to have discussions with other regions and countries around the world to further increase our capacity. For Latin America in particular, we are aware of the urgency to have a broad access to a successful vaccine to start the recovery of the economic and the social systems and to allow Latin Americans to move to a next normal as soon as possible. So we were very happy to partner with Carlos Slim Foundation to pursue that uh, ambitious, ambitious goal. And we're also looking forward to working with a manufac manuf Mexican manufacturer, Lyomont, on the technology transfer process for the production of the finished product for Latin America. I have to say the response of the Slim Foundation to this pandemic is a great example of the tremendous difference private organizations that are driven by a purpose can make to the lives of millions. The public-private partnerships across LATAM to address this crisis have been very energizing for me. And they are an example for the rest of the world, I believe. At a time of growing polarization, This broad collaborative effort shows that there is a better way. So again, I would like to thank the Slim Foundation and Mexico for their leadership of this project. On the AstraZeneca side, the response of our employees across the world has been a reflection of the organization's values in action. And our leaders have acted with the sense of urgency and the level of intensity that this crisis demands. Also, we are aware that the work is just beginning. I'm very proud of how the team has pulled together and lived our values while maintaining focus on delivering for our patients. Pascal, esto ha sido un ejemplo sobresaliente de cómo cuando los gobiernos, las empresas privadas y las fundaciones trabajan juntos, los resultados son sobresalientes. 
Es decir, sumando esfuerzo, los resultados se multiplican. Pero ¿por qué la mayoría de las veces esto solo sucede cuando hay una crisis? This is a great question, Tony. I keep coming back to the potential of each and every one of us to contribute to society. There are some existential threats like global climate change that can have even more dire consequences for the world than COVID-19, but are not equally apparent to everybody here and now. By contrast, we've seen the COVID-19 pandemic unfold in real time with tragic loss of life, collapsed healthcare systems and devastating societal and economic consequences. All of this caused by a virus that knows no borders. There is a sense of urgency that is unfortunately not there as it relates to climate change. And an urgent crisis generates the need for collaboration. We are all in this together and we need to beat the virus together. So the goal is clear and the cost of not achieving that goal quickly is immensely high for all. This realization prompts people and organizations to rise to the challenge and unite around a common objective, whether it is finding a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine or leading a community effort to provide groceries to those impacted by the pandemic. One of the silver linings of this difficult period has been to see what society can achieve when we pull aside differences and we work together towards an urgent solution that needs to work for all. For example, we've seen the pharmaceutical industry rise up to the challenge in the face of this pandemic entering into big collaborative efforts with academia, with governments, non-profit organizations, other pharmaceutical companies to support the global response efforts. We've seen countries collaborate in Europe, in Latin America, in South Asia. So when we move to our next normal, we'll be able to look back to great examples of partnership among stakeholders from all walks of life that we would have never thought possible before this pandemic. Hopefully we will learn that all of us can contribute to society and, we, and that we can achieve outstanding results by leveraging our collective strengths. And I would also say that I hope, I really dearly hope that the world will learn this lesson to really deploy resources and efforts to prepare and to, to, fight, for, uh, to fight climate change and to prepare for potential other uh, crisis, it is really fundamental that every country, the, all the countries around the world get together to put in place plans to fight this terrible climate change that could one day, if not managed, create crisis that will be multiple times greater than uh, this COVID crisis. Pascal, todos esperamos que una pandemia como esta nunca vuelva a suceder, pero en caso de que esto ocurra, ¿Cuáles son las lecciones aprendidas? This is a key point, Tony, and this is a work in progress, as I believe we will have more to learn from this very difficult experience. The big lesson is that this crisis showed us societies are prioritizing health ahead of the economy. This is a big change, as never happened in the history of the world. So establishing a well-functioning, resilient and inclusive healthcare system that can take care of people during health crisis without having to shut down the economy should really be a global priority to mitigate the enormous loss that, are, that a similar event can cause in the future. So what are the practical learnings? I think first of all, an event of this magnitude really shows what science can do and the value of innovation. Since the outset of this crisis, science has provided public health tools to mitigate the spread of the virus. And also by following the science, we will come up with innovative solutions that will allow the world to start the recovery process and move on to the next normal, treatments or vaccines. Innovation will also enable us to treat patients better without having to visit hospitals for the use of digital technologies. The second learning is the crisis showed the need for global collaboration between governments, but also between private and public organizations. Governments must give up on self-centered policies and embrace collaboration, in particular at the regional level, because global efforts, I think, are often tedious and can become very rapidly bureaucratic. So the LATAM collaboration for me is a really great example. And the third lesson, I think, is that the crisis accelerated the digitization of our societies. 
Imagine the impact on the economy if we had not been able to work remotely from home. If this pandemic had struck just five years ago before the emergence of efficient digital communication tools, the impact would have been far greater on the economy, the ability for students to learn, etc., etc. I think the last learning is that our societies, which we think are sophisticated and robust, have actually proven very fragile. And there are other potential crises to think of. We may find that this COVID crisis was a small one if we faced a substantial climate change related crisis. So I hope governments invest in science and innovation in their economic recovery plans, put in place a resilient healthcare system, roll out digital infrastructure such, such as 5G and fiber optic, and take a collaborative approach internationally. I also hope that the crisis will be a wake-up call that uh, we need to take climate change very seriously and act with urgency. So let me end with a personal and a collective reflection. As out of adversity comes a unique chance to become better individuals and build a stronger society. We have learned that science and global cooperation can enable us to overcome great challenges. By adapting to this crisis, we are becoming stronger and more resilient individually and collectively. Despite these difficult times, I believe that if we learn from this crisis, we will emerge stronger and build a bit better future for all. Pascal, nuevamente, muchas gracias por tu participación en este tan relevante foro para el futuro profesional de miles de jóvenes mexicanos. Muchas gracias y mucho éxito. Ante la emergencia sanitaria provocada por el COVID-19 en México, Fundación Carlos Slim emprendió las siguientes acciones para apoyar a la población a través del sector salud y su personal. Con el propósito de fortalecer la capacidad de análisis de los laboratorios en el país, se ha dotado de equipos e insumos para realizar pruebas de detección de COVID en los principales institutos nacionales de salud, los hospitales federales de referencia, el Instituto de Diagnóstico y Referencia Epidemiológicos de la Secretaría de Salud, así como en la red de laboratorios estatales. Al día de hoy, se han donado en total 270.821 insumos para la aplicación de pruebas. Con el objetivo de mejorar la capacidad de atención, se donaron diversos equipos especializados, tales como ventiladores para la atención de pacientes en estado crítico, para la seguridad del personal de salud, han sido entregados más de 1.836.000 equipos de protección esencial, en particular mascarillas N95 de alta calidad, para que pudieran desempeñar sus actividades con los más altos estándares de bioseguridad. Asimismo, en el contexto de la emergencia sanitaria, Grupo Sanborns ha contribuido con más de 943 mil comidas para el personal médico y de apoyo de 33 hospitales públicos de la Ciudad de México, de Jalisco y Nuevo León. COVID es una nueva enfermedad que representa retos nunca antes vistos en la atención de pacientes. Por ello, se integró un hub de cursos y tutoriales con la mejor oferta académica de prestigiosas universidades del mundo, además de cursos desarrollados por la Fundación y el Instituto Nacional de Ciencias Médicas y Nutrición Salvador Subirán para que el personal médico, de enfermería y otros profesionales de la salud desarrollen las habilidades necesarias para hacer frente a esta situación de emergencia. En la alianza con Institutos Nacionales de Salud y con el Gobierno de la Ciudad de México, se apoyan en la investigación y protocolos para la búsqueda de tratamientos para pacientes ambulatorios y hospitalizados con covid Asimismo, se han documentado los beneficios de las acciones en salud digital que ha realizado la Fundación. Fundación Carlos Slim, Fundación Telmex Telcel, Fundación Inbursa, CIE, el Gobierno de la Ciudad de México, la UNAM y el Instituto Nacional de Ciencias Médicas y Nutrición Salvador Subirán, junto con otras empresas y fundaciones, hicieron posible la reconversión del Centro City Banamex en la unidad temporal COVID-19. 
la unidad temporal ha implementado una serie de innovaciones y buenas prácticas que han impactado favorablemente en la atención de los pacientes. Entre ellas, destaca la estrategia de atención y hospitalización anticipada, la cual se ha instrumentado a través de 48 centros de triage en toda la Ciudad de México, en los que se ha valorado a más de 33,400 personas. A la fecha, la unidad temporal COVID ha recibido más de 2,600 pacientes, de los cuales el 99% ha evolucionado favorablemente. La unidad temporal cuenta con 574 camas, lo que representa el 30% de la capacidad hospitalaria de la Secretaría de Salud de la Ciudad de México. A partir de la experiencia exitosa con la unidad temporal, se ha apoyado a los gobiernos de Tabasco y San Luis Potosí para el establecimiento de sus propias unidades temporales. De igual manera, Fundación Carlos Slim se unió a los esfuerzos de reconversión y ampliación de la capacidad para habilitar 571 camas en hospitales COVID en Guadalajara y Monterrey. En agosto pasado, se firmó una colaboración entre la farmacéutica AstraZeneca, las empresas de biotecnología Mav Science y Leomont, y la Fundación Carlos Slim, con la participación de los gobiernos de América Latina, en particular los de México y Argentina, para contribuir a la producción y distribución, sin beneficio económico, de una vacuna contra COVID-19 en la región. La potencial vacuna, que está siendo desarrollada por la Universidad de Oxford y AstraZeneca, permitirá evitar una mayor pérdida de vidas humanas, de empleos y reactivar la economía para regresar a la normalidad. Con estas acciones, Fundación Carlos Slim mantiene su compromiso en la generación de soluciones que fortalezcan los servicios de salud y beneficien a la población de nuestro gran país. México.